Welcome to the shooting show. Stand by for shots fired. Hello, I'm Johnny Rowland, your host of the shooting show, and welcome to today's program. We have another great show for you. We have a historical piece or, or a museum piece that I think you're really going to enjoy today. We have a number of features, of course, on every show that uh, we want to keep everyone interested. The judge is back from his western sojourn, or whatever you want to call it, his trip out west, and he'll be with us again today. We're so glad to have you. And friends, let me remind you, you know, we have a little break now as far as the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. We've got some halfway decent people in there. Some of them, in fact, are decent people. Now is not the time to let up if we ever were going to make an effort to retain our gun rights, to retain our personal rights. We cannot slow down now. We had some success this past fall, but the last thing that we want to happen is for us to get apathetic as conservatives, as right-thinking Americans, and say, well, uh, everything's all right. Everything is not all right. It is not all right, and it's not going to be all right unless we work at it diligently and constantly, and every chance we get, we need to make our voices heard in Washington and on local levels all over this country. You know, there's a move now to put some power back in the hands of the states, and friends, it is well overdue. So anyway, let's get a, another program started on our uh, Colt Sporter here. We have one of the rapid-fire devices fitted to it, and let me make a point here. You know, you can unleash a burst of fire such as this. But, why not, and yes, we did put that on safe, why not, rather than shooting a lot of shots at one time and not being entirely sure where all your bullets are going to go, why not take a single shot and make it count? Yes, I cannot overemphasize we need to know where every bullet goes. So let's get on with our program. Now, friends, I'm out here this afternoon and basically having fun. It's still, uh, of course, it's the first part of March, and here in Louisiana, we've often said, if you don't like the weather, well, just wait about 30 minutes, you'll get something else. And we're in, definitely in the middle of a weather pattern. Humidity is, is who knows what. It's very high. It's still a nice day to be out shooting, and we're certainly glad you could be with us. Uh, I'm out here having fun because, you know what, I'm plinking. I have one of the more useful handguns that I'm aware of, and this is a Smith & Wesson. This is a model 18-3, means third model. Uh, and who knows what they are now. This is a used gun loaned to us by the good folks at Britain's in Shreveport. But uh, this is one of those guns that is so important because it is basically a training tool, a tremendous practicing tool, one, a good tool to uh, teach a new shooter, someone that's never fired a handgun. Uh, it's also a terrific trail gun, and it's also just a lot of fun. And look now, the 22 long rifle with proper bullet selection, with proper shells, is no slouch. And we got one left. We hit that one, but it didn't fall. It was stuck a little too well. Good. Very cheap to shoot, and that's important. A lot of us out here shooting uh, must do so on a budget, certainly. And the beauty part about a 22 revolver, uh, you do have the capability of using any type of shell from snake shot to the stinger types to basic solids to uh, all sorts of hollow points. Whatever you can get in the cylinder of this gun will go bang. And that's really important because a lot of us accumulate different types of 22 long rifle shells. Of course, it'll also shoot shorts and longs. It doesn't really matter. Whatever you can get in this cylinder that's the proper size, the gun will shoot. You do have the advantage of a good, strong hammer fall, and of course the Smith & Wessons are extremely accurate. I've seen these, and a lot of people call them K-22s because it is on a K frame in 22 long rifle. Uh, I have seen them that would shoot into less than an inch at 25 yards. Uh, we don't really know what this is going to do. We hadn't tried it yet. We're going to shoot it in just a moment, but this is such a neat gun to have. Uh, a lot of people like these to keep them or in a truck or a vehicle if they're going to be riding in the country or as we talked about a trail gun. You know, these guns are so accurate and so easy to shoot well. This one has a six or so inch barrel, maybe six and a half. Uh, uh, you can literally, if you have, say, a, here in Louisiana we have cottonmouth water moccasins and we have copperheads and rattlesnakes. And literally you can get so good with these guns you can afford to shoot them enough to get really, really good with them. 
and you can take a, a snake's head off just real easy. Now then, there's a couple of things you don't want to do. This is, of course, a rimfire revolver. It has a different uh, firing pin than the center fire versions. Typically on Smith & Wesson's, the firing pin on revolvers is on the hammer. Well, on this rimfire version, the firing pin is, in fact, in the frame. And you don't want to dry fire these guns. You don't want to practice shooting a, uh, a 22, uh, most of them, uh, certainly revolvers, without uh, something there in the chamber. You just don't want to dry fire. And as inexpensive as it is to go out and shoot uh, 22 long rifles, you can just about do your practice firing with live ammunition out on the range. Now, friends, looking at the K-22, this gun has seen some use, but I don't think it's really hurt. Uh, it's very similar to our standard 357 type or size revolver, like our Wesson here. The two are very close in, in size and the way they handle. So it's very handy to learn to shoot, or if you have a larger revolver, well, you can take this K-22 and uh, honestly get the same feel on the way it works, the way it sights, uh, certainly in, in actual use of the gun. As we've talked about, these are very nicely made Smith & Wesson revolvers. This is an older model. I see it has the pinned uh, barrel here. And of course, it's seen some use. I see where someone has rubbed a little rust off the barrel and the cylinder. Operates like any other Smith & Wesson revolver. You have the latch here. And of course, in teaching someone uh, to shoot a revolver, these are awfully good training tools because they load and unload uh, just like any other or a higher powered gun. Well, let's see how it shoots. Now friends, of course, you have the excellent Smith & Wesson adjustable sights, and we have not adjusted the sights with this gun. Uh, up close, we've been shooting at small uh, targets, just plinking, and it seemed to be right on. So let's take a few shots with it and just see what it does here. And of course, one of the advantages, you have a very low recoil, almost none, and very low uh, noise with these. So let's see what we're doing here. Incidentally, if you're having trouble on flinching with your revolver, Pull the trigger halfway through and stop, and then pull the rest of the way. And it seems to help in uh, touching, uh, helping someone get over uh, a flinch. Remember, center that front sight blade in that rear notch and put it right underneath what you're shooting at. And, and that, it'll dance around a little bit, but when it gets in the right spot, then press the trigger. And I believe we have six shots. All right, let's go up and take a look and see what our group looked like. Okay, we're just shooting offhand this afternoon, and uh, we've got a less than two-inch group out here at about 15 yards or so. Uh, not entirely a bad group. And remember that 22 revolvers can be really picky about the ammunition that they like, so you need to hunt through or go through several different types and brands to find whatever your gun does indeed prefer for its best accuracy. Now then, friends, we're talking about different types of bullets. Uh, we have our two-inch group here we shot earlier, and then right after we did our piece from uh, right in front of the camera there, what we did, we took some PMC. The first group was shot with CCI Stingers, and the next group was shot with uh, PMC Zappers, which is a very inexpensive uh, cartridge to shoot, and it was less than half the size of the group with the CCI. Again, the next gun down the line, the situation might be reversed. It's just hard to say. Incidentally, this gun with a cartridge like the CCI Stinger is not uh, an altogether bad self-defense cartridge. The beauty part about a revolver is uh, on every rimfire, occasionally you're going to get misfires because of the nature of the cartridge. The priming compound is put in the rim there by uh, sort of a, a, to me it's a complicated process, but anyway, occasionally you'll find thin spots in the priming compound in the rim of the cartridge. So occasionally you're going to get a misfire with any rimfire gun. Well, the beauty part about a revolver is, of course, all you have to do is pull the trigger again, you have a fresh cartridge up, uh, to fire. Now then, as I said before, for someone who cannot handle the recoil of a 38 Special or a 32 or whatever else, the 22 is not a, uh, it's certainly a considerable choice for self-defense because 
the performance of stingers uh, is pretty darn good. We shot some small game animals with stingers and impressive uh, performance uh, normally we get is pretty doggone good. So remember you just don't have that noise and recoil. You can still get the feel of your bigger gun. Now yes, even with the 22, and this is important, with the 22, a lot of people say, well, I probably won't need hearing protection or eye protection. Trust me, we need hearing protection for any firearm. The 22s are, they have a, a sharp report and it can certainly over a long period can be damaging to your hearing. So no, you don't want to come out here and even shoot a 22 without hearing protection. There's just no need in it. If you're in the woods hunting, you're gonna shoot a couple of times, that's immaterial. Or certainly if you had to shoot a snake, well, you wouldn't worry about stopping to put your earplugs in or put your muffs on. But if we're out here practicing, and what'll happen, you'll shoot several times and your ears will may become a little bit desensitized to the noise, but you darn sure you don't want that to happen. Friends, trust me, when you come out here, you always want to have eye protection. There is no need in taking a chance. And you certainly want to have hearing protection even for a 22 long rifle. There's just no need in coming out with that. But your uh, noise and recoil is so much less, and again, you have the added advantage of being very inexpensive to shoot. And you can come out all afternoon and uh, really enjoy yourself on a very few dollars of ammunition, and plus you can go through all the mechanics of good shooting. Now then, th this uh, K22 or uh, model, what we say it was, model 18, I believe that's correct, uh, is a gun that we probably, the average person would not wear one of these out. Uh, I can't imagine how many rounds this gun would take through it. In fact, the, a lot of people run into accuracy problems on 22 long rifles by over cleaning them. And normally you won't hear me say that about a lot of stuff. More people's guns need cleaning than don't, but you have to be real careful. If you have a cleaning rod, you need one of the little bore guides if you're going to clean that barrel, this is what I recommend, a bore guide so you won't uh, hurt the crown or the lands or grooves at the end of the barrel. Now that's really important for good uh, accuracy. And the accuracy that these guns are capable of, you want to be careful in cleaning. So that's just a little tip there that I thought I would pass on. But these are terrific little guns and I think all of us need at least 122 in our battery and believe me, this uh, Smith & Wesson Model 18 is one of the very best. You know, friends, this box of Corbon ammunition and this Wesson 41 Magnum are, in fact, a perfect match for each other. But it doesn't matter whatever gun you may have, like this SKS or a hunting rifle or a 38 Special or a 9mm, makes no difference because Corbon is absolutely the best factory ammunition that money can buy, period. And also, friends, when you see a box of Corbon on the shelf, or you give them a call, realize that Corbon is helping keep the shooting show on the air. They've been one of our most dedicated sponsors. You cannot find finer people in the entire shooting industry. For information on Corbon ammunition, call them 1-800-626-7266. Again, 1-800-626-7266. Tell them you saw it on the shooting show. Friends, all of us as shooting enthusiasts should be subscribing to Shotgun News, the trading post for anything that shoots. Three big issues monthly with literally thousands and thousands of firearms bargains. Shotgun News, Post Office Box 669, Hastings, Nebraska, the zip code 68902, their phone number, area 402-463-4589, MasterCard or Visa for subscriptions only. Now call them at 1-800-345-6923.
Well, friends, here we are. My esteemed colleague here, Judge Leroy Scott, my good friend. Uh, he's back from his uh, hiatus out there in the western United States. He was out there wandering around over several states for several days, but we got him back safe and sound. You didn't go skiing while you were out there, did you, Judge? Oh, no. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was helping my daughter move. I was in Idaho, Utah, uh, Wyoming, and Colorado. Like I said, over several western states. Uh, all wonderful places. Uh, uh, those those people are friendly and have the right right uh, socio-political ideas on the average. A lot of real fine people out there, aren't they? Yes, they are. Well, we have... Uh, last week, I, I couldn't be here because of that. So I have two weekly faxes from the NRA to bring you up on. And incidentally, I want to again recommend that any of you that are interested in have fax machines can get in touch with the NRA Institute for Legislative Action Fax Network, and their telephone number is 1-800-392-8683. They're in Fairfax, Virginia, which is where the NRA headquarters is now. Uh, and I'm talking about, uh, I'm giving you now volume two, number eight, and then number nine that came in yesterday. Uh, in number eight, the NRA is after the Treasury Department uh, telling to stop registering gun buyers. That uh, uh, I, BATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Farms, conceded that they've been compiling a centralized registry of transactions by out-of-business federal firearms licensees. And uh, this week, uh, Tanya Matoska uh, responded to this illicit activity by sending a letter to the Treasury Secretary asking that they stop it and that all records compiled by them to this date be purged. Uh, she cited the 1986 Firearms Owners Protection Act plus current and past Treasury appropriation bills which prohibited BATF from compiling such data. Uh, Ms. Matoska uh, noted that the registration of law-abiding citizens' firearms has historically been a precursor to even more outrageous activities ending ultimately in confiscation. She's absolutely right on that. Uh, the letter informed Secretary Rubin that if he fails to take remedial action, the NRA will explore legal action. She uh, concluded by advising Mr. Rubin of the fact that recent decisions by federal courts declaring federal background checks, uh, and et cetera, of the Brady Act unconstitutional and that highlights the court's willingness to strike down federal firearms laws. Now, he goes down through details on a lot of states, uh, and we simply don't have time to take up all of the states that are listed. Uh, we've got, uh, for example, in last week's facts, we had Arkansas, California, Kansas, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, Virginia, Wisconsin, and Wyoming. Uh, all of which gave you current information about legislative activities in those states. And I think that's important for you to know, particularly if you're in those states. Uh, now, I noticed in the Shreveport Times, our local newspaper here, there was an editorial not just a few days ago about how the Brady Act was working. It did a great job. It, is, it had identified uh, how many thousands of of people who sought to purchase firearms and who were denied that right. It's just not true, is it? No, it's, it's not true. That's just a bunch of baloney. Uh, NRA ILA Facts Network gets down to it. it, says, this is the one that came in yesterday. After one year, Brady Act proves to be a flop. Out of all of those thousands of people that the editorial said had been stopped from buying firearms, only four prosecutions, four, one, two, three, four prosecutions have occurred because people were violating federal law by prohibited, per, prohibited persons trying to buy a gun. The report issued by the Attorney General the first year netted four federal prosecutions. This revelation shouldn't surprise anyone, however, as under the Clinton administration, Federal prosecutions of armed criminals have plummeted 23%. This goes to show that while, while Clinton is long on political rhetoric, 
political talk. Mm. He's missed the boat when it comes to crime fighting. Now, when you say that the prosecution of armed criminals, now, what they normally do, they plea bargain that away. Is that right? Well, that depends on the individual federal prosecutor. They might, they might plea bargain away, but the thing is that they were, that these are the only four that have been brought. What happened is, with all of the other thousands, and this is what the facts tells us about, what the news reports haven't told you is that the vast majority of individuals initially identified as being prohibited from buying a gun under the Brady Bill are later found to be qualified. Mm -hmm. In fact, many persons are being denied their right to purchase a firearm because they've been misidentified or have unpaid parking tickets, if you please. Uh, so much for pre preventing violent criminals from obtaining firearms. Uh, this again is a ridiculous, is a ridiculous thing. Uh, well, as, as, as we've said, the anti-gun types are hard at work. Uh, they're not going to lay down on their, uh, what they think their job is. They're not going to lay down. Well, they're not going to lay down on their propaganda, and furthermore, they're not even going to tell the truth about right. it. Now, in the States, uh, they were talking this week about Florida, Illinois, Kansas, Minnesota, Oklahoma, Texas, Utah, Washington, and West Virginia. Uh, the uh, NRA this last week uh, ran ads in the Washington Post and USA Today calling on President Clinton to pull in the reins on the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms because of his long history of engaging in campaigns of intimidation and harassment, confiscation of property, fabrication of criminal charges, and even deadly force. And there they're talking about Waco. And I want, want all of us to remember. Remember Waco. A hundred years ago it was remember the Alamo. Now it's remember Waco. And incidentally, in a most unlikely place, in an extremely liberal publication I saw on the cover today, and I bought the magazine because I wanted to read that cover. It's in Penthouse Magazine. There are about five pages on the Waco Fiasco. Really? And they, with a liberal magazine, tremendously liberal magazine, they just came down hard, hard, hard on BATF and uh, for committing the atrocities that occurred there. And they were atrocities. When you start uh, storming a place, using tanks, gunships, helicopters, and all that kind of thing, and then, and then in, injecting gas into the place and killing everybody when they know there are women and children in there. And all, and the magazine points this out nicely, they have not substantiated any of the charges. None. Mm -hmm. uh, and the BATF black uniforms had BATF on the back, but not on the front. So as far as the Branch Vidians were, were concerned, they were being invaded by a bunch of black uniformed people who they didn't know who the devil they were. In fact is, they asked them, don't fire their women and children in here, and the firing took place. Uh, we got a uh, fax in today from a uh, Susan Johnson addressed to us and telling us, hey, watch our program every week, and we thank you for that. And they want our, our viewers to, uh, and incidentally, this particular lady had a brother, his wife, and their daughter uh, at the Branch Vidians or at Mount, uh, Mount Carmel, and they were all killed. Uh, they filed wrongful death, death lawsuits against the BATF and the FBI and the federal agents, and they're asking that we publicize on the program that they would like to have people write the senator, who is the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, very friendly to firearms owners, that Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah, good man, great man, mm -hmm. uh, to please call for and initiate a complete investigation and a uh, uh, and a rundown on exactly what happened there. The uh, they <laughs> they say this: my brother Steve did not deserve to die because of a of a paramilitary raid to serve an arrest warrant for David Karsh, a warrant that could have been served off the premises almost any day, a warrant that was not even valid. The BATF is an agency completely out of control, and they've been out of control for years. They broke the law weekly, and there is no one to hold them accountable. Your committee should. And that's what they want everybody to do. Write 
Senator Orrin Hatch, in the Russell Office Building, Washington, D.C. Um, Eighty-six adults and children died in what she calls this unnecessary raid, and from what I've seen, it seems like it was highly unnecessary. Uh, they haven't found any illegal, uh, I, I hate to use the term illegal guns. There's no such thing as an illegal gun. Uh, there is the illegal possession of some guns. There's the illegal sale of certain guns. But they haven't found anything that related to that in the debris afterwards. And incidentally, the... Uh, uh, the paramilitary forces that stormed the place left their weapons in mixed in with the others so nobody can tell who had what. Uh, incidentally, we're going to try to send a tape of this particular uh, session to a friend of mine in Colorado, a uh, city court judge in uh, Woodland Park, Colorado. He was my sponsor for the Colorado Bar, and uh, uh, which I am a member of, inactive, but nevertheless a member. And he didn't know anything about this program, and so we're going to send him a copy of this tape and uh, of this program and, and let him see just exactly what it's all about. He's got some friends that have satellites and uh, satellite receivers, and so we'll uh, maybe we'll gain some additional listeners up there, of uh, viewers. And that gets us down to one other subject. I understand last week that my friend Johnny and uh, whoever else was on the program with him, uh, I think it was Colonel Evans, uh, Boosted me for the uh, NRA board for of the National Rifle yes. Association Board of Directors. Yes. Uh, the Arklatex gun collectors tried to nominate me, and apparently they, uh, they didn't find out enough about the nominating process or whatever it was. In any event, my name doesn't appear on the ballot. Leroy Scott, 2620 Centenary Boulevard, that's C-E-N-T-E-N-A-R-Y, Centenary Boulevard, Suite 100. Shreveport, Louisiana, 71104. I would be happy to be elected to the NRA board, and I can promise you the views that I've expressed on this program will be heard. Oh, absolutely. I think you would do the NRA a world of good if you could get in that, in, in that capacity. Absolutely. So, friends, we ask you, if you can vote, please write in my colleague here, Leroy Scott, for, uh, for the board of the NRA because... Uh, he will help all of us. If we can get you in uh, some capacity there, I guarantee I, I know things will be a lot better. I know it. Well, got anything anything else for this week, Johnny? Well, it's, uh, uh, that pretty well covers it, and we're glad to see you back and in, in good health. And Believe me, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> it well, wasn't that it was so cold up there. It was just that it was... Long way. Do you realize that to drive across... Wyoming is a long ways. Wyoming's not far behind Texas. In, it in sure is. It's a big state. <laughs> big state. More and more often, women are faced with protecting themselves and their homes. But another way of protection is through information. And we at the Shootin' Show believe that the new American magazine has the best information that you can possibly get. You can get the new American by calling 1-800-727-TRUE true and those numbers of course are 1-800-727-8783 the new american twenty two dollars for a six month subscription it comes twice a month friends you need this magazine if you want to know what's going on and in times like this we need both of these we need our guns and we darn sure need our information Well, friends, we hope you're enjoying our program today. Well, we have a special selection coming up. Uh, uh, we had Jennifer in the Air Force this week. Or, I mean, let me rephrase that. We had Jennifer on the air base. 
And that was fun, wasn't it? It was a lot of fun. It really was. It was it was cold once again, but we really had a lot of fun um, doing our piece, and and certainly wished we could have done more. There are lots of places. Well, we'll to have see. to go back. There's a lot of things out there we didn't get to see. And incidentally, we want to thank everyone. Uh, uh, Jennifer, I guess you're in the mail order picture business, I guess, because we had a tremendous response <laughs> for your picture. Do you have that picture somewhere? We, Can we? Yeah, yes, I do. Uh, now, friends, you know, again, with Jennifer's a young person here trying to work her way through school, <laughs> and uh, this helps certainly helps her. And, and plus, you're really going to like this picture. This is, in fact, Jennifer's picture. We'll get a mm -hmm. close-up of that at some point. And uh, we do appreciate all the response. In fact, uh, we're we going to, what's your address? How can they get your picture, Jennifer? They can write to Jennifer's picture, uh, care of Austin Management, P.O. Box 5214, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71135. Okay. Now, if you don't feel like writing, you can call our Shoot and Show 800 number and ask for Jennifer's picture and give your credit card number. It's four ninety five plus a dollar and a half shipping and handling for a total of... <laughs> <laughs> A total of six dollars and forty-five cents total, and I think you still have a few you can autograph. We hadn't reached your two hundred and fifty yet. Not quite, but we're close. Uh, incredible response. I appreciate it a whole lot. And um, l like we said before, if if you want to write or or whatever, um, yeah, just just mail it to P.O. Box five two one four, Shreveport, Louisiana seven eleven three five, and we will do our best to get these out to you as quick as possible, but please allow two to three weeks delivery. Well, your hand's getting kind of tired, isn't it? From yeah. autographing those pictures, but it's a nice thing. We're happy to do this for Jennifer. You know, you're probably going to wind up on a soap opera or something somewhere one of these days. I yeah. sure hope so. Well, <laughs> well, we're certainly glad to have you assisting well, us thank on you the very shooting much. show. Absolutely. So, well, how about let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, piece that we did out at Barksdale. What do you think? Okay. Roll it. Well, friends, here we are today on Barksdale Air Force Base, and, of course, Jennifer Hancock here and our good friend and associate Al Evans. Al, in fact, uh, used to be here not by choice, in fact. He's a retired colonel in the Air Force, and he's going to be showing us or telling us some of the things about the museum today. I'll tell you what, friends, this is very impressive. Jennifer, what's the official title of where we are? The official title of the place where we are is called the 8th Air Force Museum, and it is on, like, like Johnny said, it is on Barksdale Air Force Base, and this is in Bossier City. And, uh, Louisiana, I'd like to. Yes, and the, the room that we're in right now is called, simply enough, the Barksdale Room. Uh, this has some of the artifacts and stuff, um, how, how the thing got started, and we even have... Um, Right behind us, uh, a, a interesting fact I learned a while ago, um, when they were searching to, to look for a name for this place and for uh, the base itself, they wanted to, um, you know, they usually got um, people that had served or had died in action or m missing in action or whatever. And interesting enough, and I bet you, I bet Al knows this, I don't know if Johnny does, um, <laughs> Colonel Barksdale they couldn't find anyone from Louisiana. They couldn't even find anyone from Texas. So Colonel, guess, wait, does this mean that here in Louisiana we were slow uh, pilots? <laughs> we were black right. pilots. <laughs> so they found Colonel Barksdale. He is from Mississippi. So that's where we got the name, but we adopted that. And um, very, very grateful to have that. And this is quite an interesting place, as Johnny said. And I think we're going to be taking you through some of these rooms. So well, I think Colonel Evans had a comment. Okay. Right yes, sir. Well. This is one of the uh, unique museums in the Air Force. Of course, you know, when I got in, we wore brown shoes. Um, you got in, what, 1962? That was... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid it was 43. Uh, anyway... Um, and this, you're coming up on the anniversary, too, aren't you, Al? Yeah, yeah. On April the 15th, 1945, I got my wings in commission as a pilot in the Air Force, Army Air Force, and that was 50 years ago. Wow. You wouldn't believe it. See, I was a child pilot. I, I, he was. Yes. A baby. Right. Yes. The first baby ever. Well, but, you know, <laughs> you, you were flying what, and you were 19 years old. You were flying uh, what? B-25s and B-26s. And, uh, you were a 19-year-old kid, Al. Right. You were just a 19-year-old wet-behind-the-ears kid. But I had some of the nicest two-engine toys you have. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to fly the B-17 one time and uh, didn't get shot at, so I came out all right on that. 
Well, we're so glad you did. In fact, and friends, this is a terrific thing. We're going to be highlighting some things, and we have a young lady that works uh, here in the museum, and she's going to be assisting Jennifer and Al and, uh, and myself, of course, in showing us some of these unique features. Now, you know, the Air Force used to be part of the Army, and Army, it was the Army Air Force. When did, in fact, it become a separate entity, Al? In 1947, we got our separate branch, we say. It was part of the War Department. Uh, it was a branch of the Army. Um, my original commission says Air Corps. However, they were calling it also the Army Air Force at the time. But then in 47, we got a separate branch, and so it became the United States Air Force, USAF. Now. Well, and believe me, you talk about connection with the shooting show, believe me, these people in the Air Force have done quite a bit of shooting. And we do have some interesting and unique things to show you. Oh, we got shot at a little bit, too. <laughs> I, even, I even stayed in it until uh, shortly after I got shot at in Vietnam when that was going on. And uh, I retired not too long after that. Well, you know, Al, this looks like a big motor to me. Um, yeah, but it's an engine. We call them engines. I stand corrected. Yeah, um, <laughs> An engine is a piece of equipment that generates power in itself without having to be uh, plugged in somewhere. A motor, like an electric motor, has to be plugged into electricity. And if we had motors, we'd have to fly with long extension cords. Extension cord. <laughs> right. This particular engine is a GE turbojet engine that was used on the B-47, uh, we have a B-47 out here on uh, the static displays all up and down both sides of the road here. So uh, we'll be out there after a while to uh, show you the B-47 and some other aircraft that this engine has worked quite well on. We are now entering the World War II room, and um, the first thing you see when you walk in is this poster that promoted the war bonds, and this is what helped fund the thing. And, and also, uh, as we mentioned, uh, everything in here is, is actual, except for these simulated sandbags. I think these are quite interesting. These, Jennifer, are a couple of the uniforms of World War II. This one, of course, a German aviator, and uh, you might be able to tell by the breeches that they wore, the riding breeches type, and we used to wear those too. Uh, that is, not we, right. but before I got in. But this is the, the summer flying suit that we wore, and this is a life vest. Uh, we call it a May West, because uh, when you pull these little uh, uh, cords down here, it released CO2 cartridges, and uh, this then blossomed. Well, anyway, uh, this is uh, one pilot's jacket. Each of those bombs signifies a bombing mission that he went on. And we had leather helmets and white uh, scarves, and when we'd fly the open cockpit airplanes, the white scarf would flow in the breeze, you know. And, and uh, this brings back memories for me. Incidentally, uh, deer hunters would, uh, would like to know about this. These gloves actually were electrified inside. That, that is, they were electrically heated. So you plugged them in. You had a, uh, an arrangement where in your winter flying suit, you could plug these, um, these uh, gloves in, and they'd keep your hands warm. And when you had a bombing mission like at 30, 35,000 feet, the temperature is considerably below zero up there. And uh, the winter flying boots were sheepskin lined and, uh, well, you had a face protector as well as an oxygen mask, too. So uh, altogether, it wasn't too uncomfortable unless somebody shot a hole in your flying suit and let air in, you know. Okay, Al, why don't you tell us what this nose cone is here? Well, that's the plexiglass nose off a of B-17 bomber. Uh, the bombardier was up here having the most wonderful view of whatever went on. And uh, it was sort of like just being out there. Um, the engine is off of a B-24 bomber, and the cowling, of course, went around the front of that engine. In the B-17 nose, 
Uh, the hole there is where the Norden bomb site went, and uh, the bombardier used all of his drift meter readings and everything, the altitude and the speed of the aircraft and all, and fed them into the Norden bomb site, which increased our bomb aiming capability greatly. Uh, there's a little hole over on the right, a little window there, so that if the, uh, the viewfinder or lens of the uh, bomb site got fogged up, he could reach out and clean it. Of course, now I don't know what left handed bombardiers did. They might, I don't know. I would have been out of luck. I'm left handed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Al, the title on this um, exhibit here is Home Away from Home. And I see a quite interesting shape. Uh, I know this is a replica of, of where these guys stayed, but why is it shaped like that and what is it called? Well, it's called a Quonset hut, and it was shaped like that for stability. Um, it was one of the easiest to erect and one of the strongest buildings for all sorts of uses, not only uh, quarters for the airmen, uh, like we see Wild Bill here. He doesn't look so wild lying down. He's reading Stars and Stripes. We used to watch for that, uh, that uh, newspaper every week. But the Quonset hut is even in use today. The, uh, the design is a classic building design. Here we are at the, at the Legend exhibit, and we're still in the World War II room, and um, it has some quite interesting things. I was reading on one of the f fact sheets, that these curtains, they're called blackout curtains. Right. There were uh, usually two or three layers of curtains, very dark, very thick. On the inside, of course, you could have some patterns like that. Uh, the star on the flag in the window signifies that this family had one uh, son or daughter in uh, the armed forces at that time. And uh, they had lapel buttons, if you can see the lapel button on the jacket hanging there. Uh, and this fellow was an air raid warden, it seems, so he mm -hmm. was uh, serving the country too in those days. We have a Philco uh, radio, a knick-knack shelf, and a, a picture of President Roosevelt. Oh, yeah. President Franklin D. Roosevelt. This is a poster that um, was an advertisement for a particular cigarette company. And uh, this was back in the day when uh, women were having to go to work in factories and uh, plants and so on and so forth. You may be needed now. Well, now we're here in the art gallery, and we're having so much fun traveling through these different rooms, and as we get deeper and deeper into this museum, we're finding more artifacts and a lot of neat stuff, and we're here at this display. Tell us about Hi-Ho Silver. Oh, well, this was uh, a B-17 uh, that flew a lot of missions and did a lot of bombing and uh, did a good job in helping us win the war. Um, as far as the art is concerned, you see this crewman's jacket here has the insignia of the aircraft and the name Hi-Ho Silver on it. And you can see in pictures of the aircraft itself the same artwork on that. Um, I had a cousin, Vince Evans, who flew as a bombardier. We were talking about bombardiers a while ago. He flew a uh, bombardier on the Memphis Bell. And uh, they had the insignia all over everything, yeah. And they also, they have it on the, their left, right here on their lapel, is, is neat too, I guess, so you can see it yeah. coming in. going. Yeah, that, that's right, because that's the way we won the war. We oh, were just coming and going teamwork. all the time, yeah. <laughs>
We as Americans have the right to choose or pursue the best of anything. But when it comes to ammunition, for a handgun or rifle or even some specialty calibers, Corbon is the best. For information on where you can get Corbon, information on their product line, call them. Corbon Bullet Company, 1-800-626-7266. Again, give them a call. It's a free call. 1-800-626-7266. Trust me on this one. Corbon is the best there is. This is the famous Thunder 5 revolver shooting the 45 Colt cartridge, also the 410 shotgun shell. It's also available in 4570 and includes some caliber inserts that are optional. And let's get that snake. For information on the Thunder 5, for information on the Thunder 5, call 1-800-654-0797. Again, that's 1-800-654-0797. There's so much different art in this room. We have, we talked about the display a while ago, and, and now what kind of art do we have here? Well, this, of course, was oil of General Mitchell, General Billy, uh, Billy Mitchell, and uh, his name was put on our B-25 bomber, uh, the one I was flying when I graduated from flight training. And uh, this is an example of photographic art that we had then. Uh, this is one of the things that made me want to get into aviation cadet training. I saw these young fellows in their helmets and all, and I said, I want to do that. Uh, but as you see, this was U.S. Army Air Forces. Incidentally, today's star on our aircraft is a white star. It does mm -hmm. not have that red dot in it. Uh, when we got into World War II with Japan, their emblem was the rising sun. And uh, there was confusion in the air between whether the red dot meant it was the United States Army Air Force airplane or uh, a Nipponese airplane. We certainly didn't want any confusion there, did we? Oh, no. <laughs> this definitely, uh, truly brings back a lot of memories for you, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. And uh, here's another painting, very excellent painting. The detail is just great. Uh, this was the Supermarine Spitfire, which was uh, a British fighter. And uh, here's the B-17. Uh, Bob Arnold was the artist who painted this one in oils. And uh, you see more art on the nose, mm -hmm. American Beauty. And getting into more modern times now, <laughs> these are emblems of the 718th Bomb Squadron and uh, the shield of the Strategic Air Command, SAC. And uh, this is a B-52 here. That's our modern-day big bomber flying out of Barksdale. And the Air Force shield. Well, Al, this, this definitely is my favorite piece of artwork. This is a beautiful picture, but, but why is it painted on the brick? Well, I don't know. Uh, I guess that this was the brick on the outside of a building where the crewmen from the aircraft that had this as nose art decided to leave their mark on the building and between missions uh, uh, one of their crewmen probably painted this on the side of that building. True artists. Oh yes. We had uh, some good artists in those days. Uh, Petty, Varga, uh, Bill Malden was a pretty good artist but he didn't do things like this. He, he did the uh, uh, sad sack and other things. Uh, uh, Joe and, and Willie in uh, Stars and Stripes. And that's one of the things we looked for every week in Stars and Stripes was those uh, cartoons and the other artwork. And everything was unique and they definitely wanted to leave their mark. That's right. Put it, <laughs> put it on a brick building. This is the tail of the B-52. This is where the tail guns uh, fired at the enemy. Um, it had four fifty calibers back here. Um, incidentally, we were talking about the B-25 back in World War II a while ago. 
The B-25 had one model. We had a G and an H model in the B-25s, too. One of them had a 75-millimeter cannon in the nose mm. down in the lower left of the nose. And uh, then another model, the other one, I had uh, uh, eight 50 calibers in the nose, two rows of four. And with the top turret firing forward, and we had four package guns also on the outside. So with that aircraft, we had 14 forward firing 50 calibers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could use them for low level strafing missions, just like a fighter, really. Totally amazing. I tell you, you learn something new every day. And an interesting fact, I'm, I'm looking at the, the stats here on this, that this thing held over 48,000 gallons of fuel. Amazing. Yeah. And multiply that by six pounds, and you see how much weight that fuel was. Well, six point something, depending on altitude and several things. But uh, the maximum gross takeoff weight on this aircraft was 488,000 pounds, almost half a million pounds. Now, um, we flew C-124 four-engine cargo, and the maximum on that was 175,000 pounds. So you can see how much more this thing could carry. We're now here in the last room of the museum, and we're here in the gift shop with Lee, and she is the gift shop manager, and she's going to tell us a little bit about um, some things she can help you with, some things you can find when you do come out to the museum to visit. Tell us what's, what's going on here. <laughs> we sell T-shirts, hats, posters, um, any kind of aviation gift you might want. The teddy bears are, are a neat, neat idea. Tell us a little bit about those. We can hand paint these with the different squadrons. If we don't have the artwork, if uh, you provide it with us or to us, we can paint this on there. It is hand painted, so something a little personalized gift. For me. Well, Lee, it's, it's it was easy enough for us to find find our way out here. But but tell the folks how how they can get to the museum. It's it's relatively easy. But tell them tell them what gates and and exactly how to get here. Just coming through the north gate. Uh, it's free admission and free parking. It's just right inside the north gate to the left, and they'll be glad to assist you. Well, Jennifer, you want to call home? We're, uh, so. we're standing beside an authentic English phone booth, and it was brought over from England, and uh, I've made calls out of them before. We're here at the outdoor part of the 8th Air Force Museum. There are quite a few aircraft on display here. The past 50 years, at least, of aviation. This is a B-47 here in front, and you might have seen Jimmy Stewart fly that one in the movie Strategic Air Command. Uh, this is the aircraft, incidentally, Jennifer, that the um, engine we were talking about in there a while ago uh, fit or came off of. Uh, this is the F-84 Thunderstreak here. Um, you might compare the size of this and the weight of it. The maximum weight of this is 27,000 pounds. And a while ago, we talked about the B-52G, 488,000 pounds. Right. But this was quite an airplane, uh, had a top speed of 685 miles an hour, which is boogieing right along. Uh, the F-86 uh, Sabre jet looks a whole lot like this one, but it's the one that really did uh, the job in the Korean War. And over here is the P-51, and uh, that was one of our top fighters, one of our fastest ones. The thing that we had that was nearest the Supermarine Spitfire in World War II that the British had, uh, of course, they all flew out of, uh, I mean, those, not this one, uh, not this F-84, but they flew together uh, out of England in um, the war in Europe. Uh, now we're out here in front of this huge uh, aircraft. This is a Boeing B-17G, uh, known as the Flying Fortress. But but when we were in the art gallery a while ago and we were talking about the different uh, insignias on the planes and the and the jackets and stuff, this one's called Yankee Doodle. Yankee yeah, Doodle uh, Yankee Doodle two. I don't know what happened to one. Uh, one. <laughs> probably lost that one uh, during the air war in Europe. But you see the uh, the nose up there. That's that beautiful greenhouse uh, that the bombardier sat in, and uh, you see his bomb site up there, and uh, the two 50 caliber machine guns there that he controlled from his position in the nose. 
uh, as I was saying about all the all the different aircrafts behind us, uh, they they have a MiG, a MiG-21, and um, in the near future they're going to be getting a, a Russian bomber called the Backfire. So they're really excited about that. They're constantly adding to this place and. Um, Numerous, numerous planes. We would love to do a, a special on this and <laughs> yeah. take all day. <laughs> <laughs> Might point out that uh, this is a B-24 here, and right next to it is a C-47, and then there's a smaller one there, the C-45. Um, I flew the C-47 for European Air Transport Service in uh, all over Europe. Okay, we were talking about the uh, C-47. Uh, that is the military version of the DC-3, one of the finest aircraft ever built. And uh, then there's the C-45, I point out, and then there's a trainer, and we have a British Vulcan over here, and B-52 models, and the MiG is over there, and someday, maybe when it warms up, we can just go way over there and show everything. Lots of history. Lots of history here, and, and we've, we've thoroughly enjoyed being here, and, and I know I've learned a lot. I hope you at home have. Um... Well, friends, we sincerely hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I appreciate uh, Jennifer, you, and, and Al uh, taking us on this tour. It is a fabulous uh, display they have. Uh, there's so much. In fact, I'd hate to, I'd hate to take a, an adding machine and try and <laughs> And, and tabulate the amount of, hey, taxpayer money that's out here. <laughs> well, all that money in, invested in all these aircraft went to good use. Well, I, I would certainly agree. This is one of the better uses. In fact, uh, I think that's the primary need for a government is helping to defend the country. And, and maybe we could have it do more of this and maybe keep more out of our personal lives. But, uh, it is really a worth your while and time if you're within hundreds of miles and you like aircraft and you like some of the armaments and, and military history, uh, this would be an awfully good place to come to. Uh, what days do they say they were open? Are they open every day? I think they're open every day. It, it's You come in the north gate, it's right to your left, the admission is free and, and like I said earlier, it's about, it, the museum itself covers about 3,000 square feet right now, but very soon they're going to be expanding to 20,000 square feet. So That's going to be fabulous. Of course, that's the inside where we were earlier. Right, right. And of course, out here, you've got what, half a mile that Hundreds way, of so, plenty, <laughs> so of plenty of acres. Well, again, we hope that you've enjoyed this. Thing. We have really enjoyed coming and doing this, so we thank the we staff have, here, yes. and this is Barksdale Air Force Base, and they, they should be commended for their efforts. If you would like to advertise on the shooting show, you can call us at 1-800-SAVE-YOU-GUN. That's 1-800-728-8486. Our staff will be very happy to talk to you. Well, friends, it's happened again. We've run out of time for today's program. From Kurt, the judge, myself, we want to thank everyone for being with us for today's program, and we look forward to seeing you on the next shooting show.